ध्यान दिए घन ना घटे नदी ना घटे नी अपनी आंखों देख लो यो क्या कहे कबीर कबीरा यो क्या कहे कबीर दान दिए घन ना घटे नदी ना घटे नी अपनी आंखों देख लो यो क्या कहे कबीर कबीरा यो क्या कहे कबीर the title given to this doha is charity what kabir ji says charity never diminishes one's wealth as lessens not water in a flowing river experience it for yourself apni aankhon se dekh lo you don't trust me you don't believe me experience it for yourself my dear this truth often speak kabir this year i have seen it i know the truth behind it i have experienced it why don't you also experience it my dear what is the message here charity never diminishes one's wealth <clears throat> now obviously uh, if you have to uh, go with what kabir ji is suggesting uh, it can only be experienced by a true giver if you are a giver you will understand the the rationale the logic behind what it is but as we understand as we gather from our own experiences that majority of the people are not givers and those who have not experienced or tasted what kabir ji is saying are the non givers so they would question the the authenticity of this argument because they have never tasted the true joy in giving they have been non givers so as a non giver they may be they will be there are people amongst us who are non givers there is a limitation to your giving you have put a cap if at all you give you put a cap to your giving because you as uh, khalil gibran says uh, i i hope you did get a chance to refer that document those of you who have not maybe gatima will do again share it but don't read it now but keep it handy for your future reference when khalil gibran was asked a rich man went up to khalil gibran and asked to him to speak about giving and in the opening line he says you give but little when you give of your possessions when you give of your possessions you give very little so the givers the so called givers they only give a small proportion of their amassed wealth they don't give it's as good as not giving they only give only to appease their conscience they are not true givers so they have not really tasted the joy they have not tasted the uh, what kabir ji is saying that where when you the more you give the more you do charity the more it comes to you so we shall analyze why is it that people find that difficult to part with their wealth analyze that i will also throw an insight into those who do give what are the different categories of those givers and i would heavily rely on the the beautiful explanation by khalil gibran so none of it is mine but it is 
as he says, why don't you experience it yourself? It's, remember, we often told that you must approach this knowledge as you approach science or mathematics. It's a scientific subject. It is meant to be experimented. It is meant to be experienced. Once you experiment it and experience it, the knowledge is your own. You don't have to take it because somebody else says so. You don't have to take it on out of due respect or regard for someone. You have to accept it on its own merit. And if it appeals to you, take it. Okay, so why is it that people don't part uh, with their wealth? Point one is because they have developed a, a, a tremendous attachment to their objects and beings. It is whenever you develop an attachment, as you know, you lose your status of the master. So you don't have control. It's like something doesn't belong to you. You have no say in the matter. So when you develop an attachment, attachment is nothing but you are binding yourself to the wealth or the wealth. In fact, what is wealth? Wealth is nothing but a commodity with which you can exchange it with any objects or beings in the world <clears throat> or any objects for that matter. You can, you can buy with wealth many, many things. So it's not just money in kind, but anything that money can buy. So why do people develop, a, uh, uh, why people can't give is because they have developed an attachment. So you have bound yourself. It could be your home. It could be your belongings. Anything movable and immovable that money can buy, you have developed an attachment to it. So what attachment does is attachment, <clears throat> all of us are attached. There is no doubt about it. It's like the other day when we went to the doctors, not for myself, but when we were accompanying somebody, there was a lot of talk about, you know, there is cholesterol and how it affects the uh, arteries, you know, how it gets, the calcium gets formed and things. And it was interest, it was interesting to 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 learn that everybody has this cholesterol and everybody seems to have this form of calcium that that keeps getting deposited in the arteries and the veins. And then it's a matter of time comes and hits you as you grow age. It's everybody has it. it's a matter of degree. So similarly, all of us are attached. The question is degree, degree of attachment. So when you become attached, what happens is, as I said, you as a possessor, as a master, went about acquiring the objects of the world. But having acquired and developed an attachment to it, a master becomes a slave. Thereafter, you are possessed by your possessions. Your possessions possess you. So when you say possessions uh, possess you, you have developed an attachment and attachment is measured not by the quantum of your possessions, but the degree of your possessiveness in your possessions. Write down this particular phrase and that gives you clarity to what attachment is. Attachment is not determined by the quantum of your possessions. So it doesn't matter how much you possess. It's not quantity or quality of possessions that determines your degree of attachment, but it is the possessiveness in your possessions. The possessiveness in your possessions that determines the, the degree of your attachment. It's not quantum, it's possessiveness. So when you are having this possessiveness, what happens? you are not the possessor, you are the possessed. So you lose your right to part with it because you don't determine. They determine when it when you part with it. And invariably when people part with it, when the, the object is become redundant or useless or it has no value for you, that is when people give. So many people justify that what is wrong in giving something which I'm not using. I have, have a jacket which I have outgrown it 
because I have become bigger in size. Therefore, I am giving it away. <laughs> it's not that you're giving it to the people who need it because you have outgrown in size and it doesn't fit you. Therefore, I'm parting. It is not doing great charity because it you did you couldn't part with it when you had to or when you should have. Now you're giving it away, not because out of a desire to give, because it has no place for you. Why didn't you give till now? It's because you have been a slave. You are not a master. So you have no say in the matter. So that's what attachment does. Point one. Second is you can't part with wealth because you ha have wherever there is this, there is a sense of insecurity felt because you associate wealth to security. And I can't understand that. I truly can't understand that because I've never experienced security with wealth. Please challenge it. Please question it. Please examine it. Please experiment on it. There is no security with wealth. There's a saying, when you pile up your riches, fear and anxiety also pile up in proportion. As much as you pile your wealth, your anxiety and fear also pile in proportion. So insecurity is a sense of fear of what happens, what would happen. But there is no security in wealth. Why the fundamental argument, the fundamental argument you can fall back on to keep examining, is there any truth in it? Wealth is a gross commodity. Security is a subtle element which relates to your inner personality. And the law is anything cross or tangible cannot deal or cannot mend or influence something which is intangible, subtle. I'm just making a logical statement. Anything gross cannot control or influence the subtle. It's like when I Are you, are you able to relate to what I'm saying? Anything gross cannot control the subtle. Maybe it gives a, 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 a conduciveness, that's about all, but it doesn't influence it, doesn't control it entirely. So there are two types of people with reference to this context. There are people who are insecure with the wealth of the world. There are people insecure without the wealth of the world. <laughs> I don't have it. I wish I had it. I hope I have it. My life will be better with it. They are constantly I, you know, I, I remember yeah, having lived and I remember telling this to Harish uh, many years ago, what uh, Chinmananji told my guru, his guru told his guru, uh, his disciple, and my guru told me, I was his disciple, and I'm passing on to you. I don't know whether you are my disciple or not, because there are many gurus out there you have, you follow, and one of them you follow. Mm -hmm. I'll just make a point. So, when Swamiji, which is my guru, who was in Hong Kong, he was invited to Hong Kong and he, those days, I don't know, when 40, 50 years ago, Harish was not even born, I suppose, or just maybe in the cradle. Uh, I'll not make you feel old, Harish, don't worry. Eh? <laughs> so, those days he was uh, invited by uh, the people there and he used to go for lectures. And uh, 
when Chinmayananji did not see Swamiji for a little while, maybe there was a, a his absence felt in ashram. He said, hey, Partha, where are you, Partha? Apparently, he said, Swamiji, I, 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 I was coming from US and they told me to, or oh, somewhere he's lecturing and he said, I was called to Hong Kong, so I spent a few days in Hong Kong and come. And his immediate reply to him was, what are you doing in the spiritual slums there? Don't waste your time in a spiritual slum. Those are the worlds where only people worship materiality and sensuality. Where carnal pleasures and worldly pleasures thrive. And what are you wasting your time there? Yes, passingly said, what are you wasting your time there? <clears throat> and, I, and having lived in, in the Southeast Asia region for a considerable period of time and knowing what kind of a mindset people are all the time, they're interested in material acquisition and what to enjoy. They're all the time about display, all the time about exhibition, all the time you, you are around uh, attractions. It's all outward, outward, outward. And I'm not criticizing. I'm analyzing. So there are, there are people who constantly uh, are insecure because they don't have that part of the world. It's all material. And there are people who have it, they're also insecure. So security does not come from the world. Remember, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. You know, the moment you have it, you become insecure of losing it. You want power. One who has power becomes insecure of losing it. Power doesn't give you security. You have a palacious house. You have a worry about how to keep it secure. Every time there's a squeak in the night, you're worried who is entering the door from uh, house from which door, which side. So you will have to put high, high end security cameras, high end security systems. Worried, you are having sleepless nights. Who told you to build 10 by a 10 bedroom house? Who are there? Only me and my wife. Uh, so what are you acquiring, acquiring? You become a slave. So insecurity. So wealth cannot give you security because it is gross. What gives you security is something else. So security is your inner feeling. It doesn't come from anything outward. It comes from your inner transformation. One who is inner transformed, one who is inner finds that he has tapped that inner reservoir of his inner wealth, he finds his secure. So the little or more of what you have doesn't make you feel secure or insecure. Experiment on it. Experience it. Now, thirdly, why people don't part with their wealth is because they are dependent on their wealth they experience a sense of dependency, which is also a lack of spiritual quality. You're not, you, you are dependent on it. It's like if I am holding on to a, a walking stick, I will not give it away, isn't it? Because I need it, I, I bank on it. But here the dependency is mental. So there's a mental dependency on it and you believe that if you let go of it, you will be helpless, you will, you will suffer. So that sense of dependency is felt within. So that spiritual capacity and the opposite of dependency is to experience a sense of self-sufficiency. So you are not parting because you are not self-sufficient. First, I said it's attachment. Second is because you experience a sense of insecurity. The third is you experience a sense of dependency. And that arises because you don't have that sense of self-sufficiency within you. 
the capacity to be able to be without it. Now you must, you would appreciate that. I've been doing this for X number of years and I've never ever worked for myself. So it is not that you have been provided for. It is not that you have enough savings that can uh, provide you for your necessities. And what people give is not necessarily uh, substantial. You're all giving, no? You're all receiving and you're all giving. You know what you're giving. And you know what life is in terms of how to balance your, your needs and basic necessities. I'm not talking of luxury. I'm not talking of things. And this has been the life uh, fairly so. So it is never that you have a surplus but always life has been so has been so kind. People have been very kind. There will be some mysterious way, something will come and it will provide you. As if that person has heard your, your need and requirement and providence is sending him to, to find your needs and it is taken care of. And there is a phase that will happen where you sail through. And again, there will be a requirement you don't have, you're not knocking at anybody's doors. I would knock at any door, anybody's door and say, I need this, I want this. No. But what, because I've been investing, it's a serious investment. I've been investing in building this capacity to be self-sufficient. We have got such capacity to be self-sufficient to the extent where the very minimal of the world can keep us going, the very minimal. Because our dependency is not there. But yet we have to pay our bills. We have to feed our, feed ourselves and the family. You have to have some roof over your head. But there is no insecurity without it. We're all interconnected. There is no insecurity without it. And there is complete self-sufficiency because you're investing in your own inner wealth. So the inner wealth conquers the deficiencies of outer what lacks from the world. So you get what I'm saying. So the inner wealth counters the inefficiency or, or the deficiencies of the, the shortcomings of the outer world. This is one side. The opposite of that is you are surplus with the outer world and the inner wealth deficiency can never offset. Then you experience insecurity. With all the wealth of the world, you're insecure. Or you're very secure with nothing substantial to claim for. You have to experience it. One part of the world are experiencing this. They have everything going their way, yet they're not happy and contented. And I'm, I'm not saying my life is an example, but I'm telling of through experience. There is nothing. I think even Gayatrima were saying, uh, didn't, we, didn't we have a, a passing conversation the other day, Gayatrima? What were you saying? Uh, we were talking about this giving on the, like at an engage, uh, you never thought what the future is going to be, how like, you know, and you entered into this field. In fact, I'm only, I, I happened to analyze only a little later, my buddhi woke up later on only. Then what, how, what is it I had? I just jumped into it. There was never a doubt. And so it's that kind of a, uh, I don't know, you may call it blind faith or you may call it that complete surrender or completely give yourself to a cause. No assurance where you'll get the next diksha from. It's bhiksha, no? What you give with, with reverence, we live on that. No guarantee. I am not having, I am not expecting anything from you all, nor am I having any 
hidden agenda when i say this i am only trying to convey the point you are give us to this beneficiary you are being benefited from the guru ask yourself when is it you have given how much have you given put all together and put a math what is it that would go to him yesterday pushpama was mentioning in a in a meeting we all should be mindful that we are working for the foundation but let us also think that the guru also needs did you know did not pushpama say that i remember she said that in a meeting i am not triggering sentiments what i am trying to say is this is there is that fact of life where people have the outer wealth but there's a deficiency of inner wealth but they are rare few people who have who have acquired that inner wealth the deficiencies of the outer world does not matter to them it doesn't matter to me it doesn't matter to me i'm not complaining i am i'm actually reveling <laughs> all of you pack your bags and say i found a better guru i say thank you very much i have more time for myself this fellow has no capacity to talk i have better things to do okay thank you very much please go on that self sufficiency is inversely proportional to the dependence on the world inversely if you are 70% developed you only need 30% of the world to get to keep you happy remember we spoke of this chart i'll, I'll clarify again let's say if a person is 80% spiritually developed because you are investing in your own self all my time resources only investing in myself so what happens the wealth increases isn't it my wealth fund my wealth manager is myself all my funds are invested in myself hmm? hedge fund manager this fund manager wealth fund manager yeah? all that funds invest in myself so my spiritual proportion 80% then what will be my dependency will only be 20% i only need that 20% little bit of the world to keep me happy but if my if my development is only 10% which is the case with most people they very inward wealth is very poor inwardly they are poor so their dependency is 90% they need that 90% of the world to keep them going now let's talk of figures i am dependent i am i am i'm self i'm my development is 10 my requirement is 90 but i only have let's say 30% of the world with me so the deficiency is 60% deficiency that 60% deficiency is insecurity mental agitation stress which you call as hell is hell on earth that deficiency of 60% causes insecurity causes pain agony hell mental agitations you envy people who are uh, in a better position than you and you always believe that if only i had that my life would have been happy so you're constantly as if there's a if how your body reacts if there is deficiency in your essentials like the the minerals and the vitamins you know you know some people suffer uh, even the salt content uh, i don't know what do you call that you know if the sulfur sulfur if i'm not wrong you know so sorry so sodium sodium the sodium level dips uh, it has serious consequences if your vitamin d is less it has consequences if the vitamin d is less imagine if your essentials are low so the 60% deficient is health but let's say if you are developed 80% and your dependency is 20% your dependency is 20% but because of your good karma because of the your efficiency out of sheer work you have been able to produce you have 60% of the world with you i only need 20% to keep me happy but 60% to have the world with me that 40% is a spillover 
that 40 percent is heaven that 40 percent you are reveling you are you are truly secure but security comes from the development spiritual development but the need is very little but 40 percent is heaven you always have more than what you need far more than your needs why because you have dropped your desires so lack third point is lack of self sufficiency are you all with me here are you all convinced with it that don't ask sir i am with you here my internet is fine i am following but am i convinced with it that well we shall leave that for another day hmm. there are facts of life my dear hmm. the shastra say you don't know your fullness the ignorance of your fullness as we call the paripurna you don't know your fullness you feel an emptiness and it is the emptiness that creates a void and that is pushing you out into the world to constantly keep filling keep filling trying to fill something you're trying to fill the void why are you filling the void because i'm feeling the void sir <laughs> what a question i asking i'm filling the void because i'm feeling the void why are you feeling the void because you don't know your fullness if there is a void and you're trying to fill it there is no problem but the problem is there is no void that's what these masters are saying so the void you're trying to fill is imaginary what reality is your fullness that's what khalil gibran also says is not the dread of thirst when your well is full is not the dread of thirst when your well is full the thirst that is unquenchable are you all following you have a well which is full of water and you're feeling thirsty and the thirst is unquenchable you have a well which has got water full which can satisfy your thirst but the thirst is unquenchable don't you experience that experience what experience that you are not able to quench your thirst for acquisition so the well doesn't satisfy your thirst what's the use of that well he said what's the use of the water when you can't satisfy or quench the thirst perhaps these are some of the the salient reasons why people can't give people don't give cannot give so what are the reasons kashish quickly can you what did we talk of hi om guru ji um you said the reasons were when one when you've developed an attachment to your possessions or you've become possessed by your possessions two when you associate wealth with security and there therefore that leaves you feeling insecure three when you are dependent on your wealth mentally and four because you lack self sufficiency no no uh dependency is lack of self sufficiency both are the same thing okay. both are point both are point 3 and the fourth point is you don't realize the the fullness within ah no you don't realize the paripurnata within 
because you don't realize the fullness, it creates a void that generates desires and you and the rat race starts. You, you, you get that? Understood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. So these are the four reasons. I said there could be more reasons, but these are the reasons why people don't part with their wealth. And the people, those who do give, what are the uh, kinds of people who give? As I've said, majority of people don't give. A small minority of people who give, they give very little when they give of their possessions. They give very little. It is insignificant person compared to their proportion of their amassed wealth. Insignificant. So why are they giving? They could be God-fearing or they are just trying to cover up their guilt feeling that it is a responsibility. They know it's a responsibility that they should give back and they, when they hear people, others, of those who are givers, they feel that they're not doing. So they give for the, not to genuinely give, but just to satisfy their, curia, uh, satisfy their, appease their conscience, but they're not true givers. And this applies to most givers. What is that, what applies to most givers? That they give, a small aspect of their wealth, a very small percentage of the wealth. But for themselves, there is no, to their kith and kin, there is no quantitative. Sky is the limit. Again, attachment. And people, those who give, they give it for recognition. As again, I'm, I'm quoting Khalil Gibran. There are those who give little of the much which they have. There are those who give little of the much which they have and they give it for recognition. And their hidden desires make their gifts unwholesome. It's all there, you, you get that, you keep that document, which Gayatri Maya shared, you'll have all, I'm just quoting from that. So what is it that makes it unwholesome? Their unhealthy motive. So when they give, they give with a hidden desire. All this is not true giving. Now, why we're talking of this, all this aspect is because Kabirji says, what does Kabirji say? Charity never diminishes wealth. But those, if you want to experience that, you have to be a true giver. So we're trying to find why people don't give. And those, you may say, why are we talking all this? I'm giving you a panoramic picture on this concept of giving. Why people don't give and of the people who give, what are the different types of givers? So we said that of the givers, it applies to all givers. Most of the givers, they give very little of their what they have. Some give it for recognition. Third type of giving, Third is most of the people who, some, oh, some of the people who give, they give unwanted things. I remember, uh, remember this uh, very vividly in, in Malaysia. Uh, Paresh, you, you recall the Vivekananda Ashraman in Brickfields, uh, where I used to hold the classes. 
it was a very old uh, or, or a century old building the vikan nashram there we used to hold our classes there and there was some catastrophe somewhere and there was uh, a massive campaign for support and i think it's sri lanka if i'm not wrong in sri lanka and uh, um they were asking for garments you know clothing everything swept away and they wanted it <laughs> a point came they said please ah it was tsunami that's right harish tsunami and they were they had to tell please don't give so some of them gave one socks used inner garments torn clothes no that was not not the fashion tone you know simply torn clothes uh, which these are not these are the people not beggars man even you don't give to a beggar how can i wear one right leg woolen uh, socks left side silk cloth, silk sock and one is gray color other is maroon color this may be the fashion today i don't know what fashion is but you can't do what a, and imagine mountains of clothes they have to process all over the country people are just getting getting giving 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 why because i know a lady a husband who came to me and said jokingly so he said when i am trying to change the 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 structure of our wardrobes in the house because the wardrobes are breaking because sheer weight so i am trying to make them concrete steel solid steel ready garu you will have lot of work sir all fabricating please advise this to all the builders that all the cupboards must be made with reinforced steel so that there is when remember i, I was talking all these terms ready garu when he was fabricating the stage especially we were putting the ganesha where it is now he said the ganesha is close to 100 kg and is going to be positioned so it's going to be strong he said no problem guruji we will make it stronger with reinforced but i suggest you make all wardrobes at home so he said actually the wardrobe gave way the weight sheer weight sir collapsed did you get such a request regarding so far oh no guruji <laughs> fortunately no. <laughs> no no why why sir lot of business sir what are you talking why fortunately unfortunately why unfortunate uh, people are not aware of it you throw this idea every household they'll try to do and come with the designs where you can maximize little space in their houses because there is no space to put things nowadays people are acquiring 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 there's no place and they'll not give it away also they comes a uh, such a burden such a nuisance so can you imagine people if at all they give they give things which are of no use to them There's so much so as we understand you all remember the kathopanishad in the kathopanishad uh, nachiketa's father gave away sickly cows gave away sick cows you know in the center we have a coconut tree a lone coconut tree which has been very kind every time every other day there will be one coconut falling you know and most of the time it fall, some of them most of them falls outside so they disappear because many people are happy to make good use of them but what fall inside and sometimes they because of sheer fall it cracks you know but how there is a small tool and i Uh, remove them, you know. So other day, the neighbor was there, and oh no, no, the maid. I mean, Park gave a neighbor. The maid was there. I uh, said she was cleaning. I said, Lakshmi, you want coconuts? Uh, if you can spare, Guruji. My, I put my hand into the bag, and as I was trying to give away, one of them was cracked, and I was mindful. I did not give the cracked one to her. so of what which i had given i had given the good ones and the crack one i took it home it could have, it could be spoiled it could have fallen from top and 
thank god the teaching was in me the spoiled one i kept the good one i gave but nachiketa's father kept the good cows and gave the sick cows away i'm just trying to narrate how you can apply even the smallest of things keep the if at all you want to give don't commit that crime of giving unwanted things it is a sin and one of the important things we have mentioned whenever you do want to give remember you must feel a pinch when you give and only in that pinch that you grow and that's what kalil gibran says and there are there are those who have little and there are those who have little and they give it all there are some people there are some people who have little and they give it all they are, they don't feel insecure in giving and these are the bounty these are the believers in life and the bounty of life and their coffer is never empty this is the the beauty of the <clears throat> the statement i repeat these are the believers in life these are the believers in life and the bounty of life and their coffer is never empty <clears throat> this kalil gibran is echoing what sant kabir is saying the more you give the more you shall have to you have you will have with you to give your coffer is never empty these are the believers in life and the bounty of life their coffer is never empty <clears throat> and science also proves this isn't it what you have you shall lose what you give is what you have in the phenomenon of colors nature tells you that the seven colors the vibratory colors when an object is bathed in light an object appears a particular color because it gives away that color it retains what it gives away it loses what it absorbs that is science isn't it am i not right an object is blue in color because it gives away blue it absorbs every other color so you lose what you possess what you give you shall have it so the more you give the more you shall have to give experiment on it taste it and then he says and there are those who give with pain and their pain is their baptism you must be baptized to give and in the process those who want to give those who embark on giving that pain is their baptism it is the entry into the life of giving last week didn't we not talk of it passingly when we spoke about true happiness and false happiness when you want to part with something it is who remembers when you want to part with something you remember last week we did that doha false happiness and true happiness what is the characteristics of false happiness characteristic of false happiness is it is nectar in the beginning but poison at the end 
the characteristics of any true happiness is it is poison in the beginning. True happiness is poison. False happiness is nectar in the beginning. So when, so in the context, what are we saying here? Srimiji, what are we saying here? I think what you're saying here is the more you give, the the more you get kind of thing you, is what I'm picking up. Yes. And then uh, just uh, taking that further, uh, I've said that in order to experience that, some point we all have to start giving, isn't it? To experience mm -hmm. it. And then I'm quoted Khalil Gibran. He says, and they are those who give with pain. And that pain is their baptism. What is it to be baptized? What does the word baptism mean, sir? Inducted. Inducted. You're being introduced, isn't it? So mm -hmm. if you are being introduced into the life of giving, he says, you will give it with pain. So there's pain associated with giving. And I'm drawing a parallel to this, to what we discussed, which is a familiar idea, that false happiness is nectar in the beginning, poison at the end. Anything true happiness is poisonous to begin with. So if one lives a life of acquisition and enjoyment, it is pleasurable to begin with, isn't it? Yep. I don't mind sitting 48 hours or 24 hours or 56 hours to buy a new iPhone 14. iPhone 14 is launched. I never had a mobile in my life. As if I, I will sit 48 hours to have iPhone 14 in my hand. Upgrading from iPhone 13 plus to iPhone 14. Acquisition. There is always joy in acquiring. But you tell that we have to part with it. So you're developing baptism. So you get only another concept. We're saying anything true happiness begins as poison, but it is nectar at the end. Just because it's poison, you will give it away, but not realizing you are giving away something which is true happiness. So I, I was just drawing that connect, which was which was learned last week. Okay, sir. Got it. Got it. And there are those who give with joy, and that joy is their reward. They are, and there are those who give with joy, and their joy is their reward. They are not giving for joy, please. They're giving with joy. There's a difference whether you're doing for joy or with joy. They are giving it with joy. And their joy is the reward. It's just beautiful. Every word of it is so beautiful. It is well to give and ask, but it is better to give unasked through understanding. It's better to give when asked. It's well to give. It's better to give asked, unasked through understanding. And to the open hearted, the search for one who shall receive is joy greater than giving. And to the open hearted, the search for one who shall receive. Now, whom can I give next? Whom can I give next? That joy in search for who shall receive is greater than giving, he says. And there is aught you can withhold and all you shall have shall someday be given. 
therefore give now that the season of giving may be yours and not your inheritors give now all you have shall some day give some day be given therefore give now that the season of giving may be yours and not your inheritors recently i have been informed or acquainted of a person who passed away without leaving a will and it is a huge headache for the whole family to deal with all what she had amassed it was a sudden death and she did not give in her life all the time hoarded it and suddenly she is gone with no dependents with no we snapped relationship with everybody and today the so called near and dear whom she snapped they have close family members but she snapped they are they are trying to make sense of all what to do with what she had and the argument people give for not giving is you often say i would only give to the deserving oh you i i only will give you this much because you don't deserve more the trees in the orchard says not so nor the flocks in your pasture they give that they may live for the withhold is to perish oh i only give to the deserving does the tree in your orchard say so and then they went to the lady's house somebody's house and uh, she guru ji guru ji see that small plant and it looked an ordinary plant from a distance and as i went close to it she i was blown away hardly 3 feet from the ground and it had close to 100 fruits of star fruits i'm sure you all have seen the star fruit i was surprised not that common we grown and in a home in a compound a small shrub which yielded little one still growing but 100 or star fruits now is the tree saying why should i give 100 i'll give 20 and retain the rest 80 i will not give because this owner i don't like the owner this owner doesn't deserve so many fruits i will not give what should i give i will not give the trees in the orchard says no so no the flocks in your pasture they may they give that they may live because to withhold is to perish see first that you yourself deserve to be a giver an instrument of giving before you think whether the receiver is worthy of receiving you first be worthy of a giver man be worthy of a giver be an instrument of giving and he goes on goes on so please fall back on that outstanding masterpiece is a masterpiece i will if i were you i will print it i wouldn't say in gold at least in gold color <laughs> so you say why you have to invest so much in gold and gold color you print it and frame it and send the bill to me i'll pay for it because you say why oh i have to go and frame it also now if you i'll pay the bill for it i'll foot the bill all of you print in gold color frame it and hang it so that you can see it every day reminded of this so charity never diminishes wealth just like nadina ghate neer the river is perennially flowing when did the river start flowing oh when did the ganges start flowing uh, i don't know you go to the banks of the river the mighty river ganges flowing when did it start flowing i don't know has it lessened 
your forefathers have gone your grandchildren will go it will never lessen and it's continually flowing yet it has got more to flow it's exactly the same way kabir ji says charity never diminishes diminishes well your coffers will never be empty but whose coffers are empty get empty na swami amma this you have a enforcement uh, over asking the person who doesn't give the person who doesn't give correct and i in the person who doesn't give his coffers will be empty are you all agreeable to that what is the law which governs it is there a law or how do you justify that statement it's exactly the opposite it seems no those who give has never the coffer never empty and those fellows who are amassing and holding on their coffers they it will get empty i don't know the science behind it i know the i don't know the how it all works but it works so apni aankhon se dekh lo experience it yourself my dear this is the truth often spoken which kabir also so kabir also kabir i have seen it i have experienced it i want you to experience it and live a life of a giver am i a giver or a taker got to ask am i take and you may be the greatest of givers in spite of being the greatest of giver you will remain to be a taker because the taking is far more pronounced than giving in spite of being the best giver the highest giver the greatest giver and there is fatigue associated with acquisition there is no fatigue associated with giving remember this another point there is no fatigue associated with acquisition uh with there's fatigue associated with acquisition there's something called as the wealthy people experience there's some it's a, there's a, uh, a study done on this it's the, the terminology that associated with it is called wealth fatigue syndrome write down and google it so wealth fatigue syndrome so the real real wealthy people are sick and tired of wealth they are fatigued the tired of acquiring running chasing 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 you get tired but uh, you look at life of a giver he never gets tired there's no fatigue in giving and where wealth accumulates you dk oliver goldsmith where wealth accumulates men dk you are not giving because the receiver needs it you are giving because by you not giving you will remain selfish so celebrate if you find a, a receiver what would happen to givers if there are no receivers sadly today the proportion of receivers are more than givers imagine if a proportion happens other way if everybody starts giving and nobody is receiver what will happen you know there was a time in history that every time you you go home you had to take a guest with you home end of the day you are waiting in the marketplace to to have someone even it could be a stranger you just take him home to feed the atithi you know you feed the guest and then you are fed everybody is waiting to take somebody to their home to be to to serve them first today if you bring someone without notice you will not get the food 
उल्टा सितु जी मैसेज में प्राइवेट और आई थिंक ही सेंट टू एवरीबडी एज वेल दोस हु डोंट गिव फील द वॉइड दे फील दे डोंट हैव एनफ या दैट एटीट्यूड इज बिकॉज़ दे आर बिजी एक्वायरिंग दे फील द वॉइड द वॉइड कम्स बिकॉज़ दे डोंट फील द फुलनेस एंड दे आर बिजी एक्वायरिंग एंड दे डोंट हैव that in them to give and there would be ram raj if everybody are giving correct they were the days those were the days what will happen to me if i give <laughs> the highest of giving is to give yourself away you know i think it's wordsworth who says i wandered lonely as a cloud high over vales and hills i wandered lonely as a cloud wandering i wandered it was not a caravan where i took my family along with me i wandered a symbol of detachment no attachment to a particular place or a position i kept moving in my life then how did you move what did you do by moving what did you do by wandering i wandered like a cloud and what is cloud cloud when it gathers when it gets weight it gives rain and when it gives rain where there is rain there is prosperity there's wealth there's life oh very good sir i wandered as a cloud but then what thereafter when the cloud gives rain after giving there is no more cloud isn't it the cloud has disappeared so the greatest quality in giving is you give yourself away you 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 you're, you're not there anymore where is giving a portion a small portion to appease your conscience this is one end other end is when you give you give yourself away like a cloud so the symbol of giving is a cloud because when it gives it gives prosperity and the process of giving it gives itself away it doesn't exist anymore there is no contradiction to anything that we have said we are just trying to take an example to highlight what giving is true giving is and having talked of giving material giving is the lowest of all giving eh? don't think yourself big too great if you have, if at all you have done that of all the charities that you can do of all the yagna of giving you can do the four types of giving dravya yagna tapo yagna yoga yagna swadhyaya gnana yagna the lowest is material service superior to material service is physical service superior to material and physical is emotional intellectual superior to phys- material physical emotional intellectual is excuse me so there is the material service physical emotional intellectual and spiritual so the lowest is material service and this applies the principle that we have applied applies to all aspects superior to material is physical superior to material and physical is emotional intellectual superior to material physical emotional intellectual is spiritual what lives what lives what is eternal is swadhyaya 
it doesn't die. The spiritual wealth that you give doesn't die with time. That's why it's called Sanatana Dharma. The wealth of wisdom which our men of wisdom gave, the gurus of past gave, is a standard test of time. Kabir Ji, when was Kabir? What are we learning? Which era are we? It doesn't die. But the wealth you have amassed, you have, it doesn't last more than three generations. The wealth you have amassed and you have given to my children, my kid, my kin, it will not just last more than three generations. It's a firm belief. Uh, whether it's a scientific truth behind it, I do not know. You, your father has acquired hard-earned money. He has passed it to you. You are not working as hard as what he has done. You have tried to make good use. You tried to invest here and there. But you come, you hand it over to your children. They have taken it for granted. They start living a life of indulgence. And by the time in the second, third generation already gone. That's so many examples I've seen. So many people, you have seen it happening. But if you want your wealth to thrive, give. I wear you, if you have, a, if you really want to give, start giving, blindly start giving. Don't think this fellow deserves or not. Simply give. Then we'll think of right giving and wrong giving. First be a giver. And you'll have plenty more to give. Again, experience it for yourself. Vidya Dan Swamyama again is uh, intellectual service. That is part of yoga yajna. Yoga yajna is emotional, intellectual. When you're giving knowledge, it is intellectual service. And beyond intellectual service is, I'm doing swadhyaya so that I can give this knowledge to you, all this wisdom to you all. And I have to do that first. So I have to live a life of tapas so that I evolve and I, I pass this on to you all. Understood. If I have to give, I have to have it first, isn't it? So I'm investing in my inner wealth so that it grows and I can part with it. That's how life works, isn't it? But the principles are there for you to examine it. And Kashish, lastly, can you uh, capture Repeat what we said as the various types of giving. Yes, Guruji, you said there were four types of giving. The lowest is material. No, not this one. I, I oh. mean, the earlier points we said, uh, those who give, what are the various types of givers? Ah. Uh, uh, you said there are some that could give because they are God-fearing or because they're doing it for recognition or because they're trying to assuage their guilty conscience. Mm -hmm. But that's not true giving. True giving is when you feel a pinch. Oh, you also said that and there's some that give just that excess, what they don't need anymore, um, what no longer like suits them. But again, that's not true giving. You have to feel it. So, so one we said is you give for wrong reasons. In fact, one principle we said is many who do give, they give a, a small proportion of their amassed wealth, a small proportion. Majority, they give it to their own kit and kin. They give to others only a small proportion, maybe 0.1% to 1% of it. 1% also is very high. Point only decimals it is. Uh, you calculate if I, I I do not know your wealth amassed, how much you amassed, how much you amassed, put a math to it, and then tell what you're giving. Calculate all what you give in a month or in a giving, and then put math of how much you amassed. It just is decimals, it's not even one person is very high, it's decimals. So majority you give it to your kids and kids, it's going to perish in the next generation also. 
So that's uh, that's guaranteed. But so the point you uh, re uh, repeated is that you either give it for recognition. Uh, what is the other thing you said? Um, was because you're out of fear, God fearing. God fearing. To assuage your guilty conscience. Yeah, to either appease your guilt conscience or people give unwanted things, reference katopanishad. But the real giving is when you give, you feel a pinch. When you give. Means you give something which you value, which means something to you, part with it. That is true giving. Oh, I am not using a phone. I will give with it. Why I am not using? Because it's spoiled. Let me give it away. <laughs> what is that giving, man? Example. Other day, our laundry man came and I was remembering Harish. I remember Harish because many years ago, remember Harish in the Sunway Pyramid, we went and bought those small Nokia phones for the teams that were coming from Ashram every year. Yes, yes, yes. I do recall it now. Yes. Mm -hmm. This was the oldest of, you know, the Nokia phones, you know, we used to have. And we used to yeah. get people come from Ashram every year. And for that 10 days, two weeks, stay, they needed phones. I said, okay, we'll get something simple. And even those days, maybe touch phones were there, but we said, we'll get simple phones with SIMs. They all can be reachable. And they were, they were with me, you know. And suddenly, our laundryman was not reachable, Harish. They said, what happened? Sir, my phone got spoiled. I'm waiting for my son to send money to buy a phone. Something's triggered me. It has been, it's more than a, I don't know where it was, you know, it was there. I said, I don't know whether it's working or not. But then I could, it triggered me that yes, that can be there. And I knew if it all to be that the one odd phone was there. I, I picked up, I said, I'll not give you. I will ensure that it's working. I charged it for seven, eight hours, tested it's working, and then said, okay. Because they're almost very less used, you know. And I was, my silent gratitude to you, Harish. I remember that he had procured it. Uh, it was more than 10 years ago, wasn't it? Yes. Quite well, 10 years ago. Quite some time. And still working. So Nokia is gold. So I am and I'm brand ambassador for Nokia now. Uh, are they back in the market, Harish, Nokia? I actually haven't been to a shop to see mobile phones. <laughs> Neither, <laughs> Neither have I. So I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. Right. Fair enough. Right. So be mindful what you give. Be very mindful. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. We'll come back. Now, uh, I was trying to uh, make a conscious uh, adapt to a, a, a little advice that came my way yesterday that there is a, a certain, uh, I, I would be happy to receive some feedback from you all uh, that the, the interaction style which I, I, I keep doing sometimes uh, it uh, people lose their thought process because if everybody starts commenting during the cross process of the session. So they were suggesting that if to a large extent, if I can explain the concepts and leave the question answers to a later part. Uh, so it gives a, a lot of uh, time and people are able to attune to the context and the concept. Uh, I tried to adapt a little bit to that today, so I didn't interact as much as, as I would naturally. So you can personally send me what you feel about it so that <clears throat> I'm able to fine tune my deliverance so that we cover the text and at the same time, uh, you're able to get the, the message, you know? So this is just, uh, I was, I'm happy to receive feedback and I'm, I was happy people felt uh, this could be adopted. So I don't know whether you noticed that, if at all. 
So this is a slight adaptation. It might take a time for me as well, or you may find it a little odd as well, but it is, again, uh, I'm happy to change, uh, do revert back uh, to me or to Gayatrima. So we'll try to see how best to continue serving this knowledge to you, okay? We'll come back. Om Pur Namada Pur Namidam Pur Nat Pur Namudachate Pur Nasya Pur Namadaya Pur Nameva Vashishate Om Shanti Shanti, Shanti, Hari Om, Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha, Hari Om.